We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone uh, from uh, Katowice in Poland and around the world. We even have participants from Greenwich University standing literally on Greenwich Mean Time as coded by the uh, former British Empire. So we have, in fact, every hemisphere covered, not only with our speakers, but with our participants. Thank you very much for joining us at the end of day two for the 2021 Internet Governance Forum. We are now going to start workshop 184, which we've called Syncing AI, Human Rights and the Sustainable Development Goals. And the subtitle is The Impossible Dream with reference to uh, Man of La Mancha and that wonderful song. So um, uh, without too much further ado, I'm going to run very quickly through the uh, protocol and who's who and what's what, and then we'll get started. There is a poll, we have an online poll that we'd love you to take part in. It's a free association poll. So um, if we can have that pasted again into the chat. And we have also a resource list, which is at the end of the description on the IGF website for workshop 184, compiled with thanks to all our panelists. Um, so there's a wide range of resources there to give you a sense of how, how important these topics are together and separately for every sector, okay. So I'd like to introduce our, our speakers and then I'll introduce the format and then I'll pretty much uh, stay quiet and take the floor, uh, give the floor over to not just our speakers, but to our audience. Uh, we have um, in alphabetical order, uh, Ms. Renata Avilia, the uh, incoming CEO of Open Knowledge Foundation. Congratulations, Renata, and thank you for being with us. And also co-founder of many things, but uh, of Progressive International. Uh, Amelia, um, Renata is uh, from Latin American Caribbean Group. Uh, we have Paminda Jeet Singh, the Executive Director of IT for Change in India and uh, the Asia Pacific Group. We have Rashi Saxena, who's also from the Internet Rights and Principles uh, Steering Committee. And uh, Rashi is also an AI specialist with Innovation for Policy and has just been speaking in a previous session. So she'll enlighten us on some important initiatives there. We also have Mr. Thomas Schneider, Ambassador and Director of International Relations of the Swiss Federal Office of Communication, amongst many other hats that Thomas wears. Thank you for joining us, Thomas. We will have shortly Paul, Mr. Paul Nemitz, Principal Advisor to the Directorate General for Justice and Consumers of the European Commission, uh, and we have uh, Ms. Michelle Thorne from Mozilla, Senior Program Officer, leading the Open Dot uh, Program, which is a doctoral research program for the Internet of Things. Uh, there you are, Michelle. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, lovely. You've all made it. My name is Marianne Franklin. I'm uh, on the steering committee. I'm, I'm a former chair of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. Uh, and uh, my day job is professor of global media and politics at Goldsmiths University of London. And I'm joined by Minda Moreira, who is our current chair of the coalition, who will be doing the online moderation and helping us out with um, our fielding audience questions. And we have also on the ground Michael Okia, also on the Internet Rights and Principles um, um, our steering committee. That's who's who. Now, it's a big topic area. So to focus our minds and our thoughts, uh, we're all going to think about a rather a provocative formulation of the issues, uh, as one would if one was having to debate it in a traditional debate. And that uh, formulation is already written in our description, but I shall read it out for the audio and the live captioning. We are asking ourselves, what if current artificial intelligence trajectories now indispensable to how internet and other digital technologies work, are actually undermining the future of sustainable human rights and the natural world. So what if AI is actually undermining our human rights and the chances of planetary survival, to put it in another way? 
So those are the, that's the focus. Uh, the speakers, of course, will have, have um, time to uh, make their opening remarks and to elaborate because we will have three rounds, at least two rounds, hopefully three, opening remarks, uh, two groups of three, um, and I'll just call the speakers as we've already planned. We'll then have a chance to hear from the audience via the chat, if possible, uh, maybe a couple of questions from the floor. And then we will ask for panel responses. That will be the sort of analysis section. And then we'll move from analysis to action because that is the key focus. What we're not, what we should do, but we, what we are doing and what we will be doing and what we're committed to doing with money, political, um, political will and all the rest. So no shoulds in this panel, please. It is, we are and we are going to and we will, no shoulds ifs or buts. All the shoulds, ifs or buts are in part one. <laughs> First, we need to analyze and we need to establish what we think the main issues are. At all points, we love to hear from the audience. So please, people, feel free to, uh, to post your brief questions up on the chat because that is also part of the transcript, part of the official record. And we'll go from there. Um, last rule, three minute speaking rule. And I've got a little timer. And I will actually have to assert it. I've, I've used up all my uh, speaking rights for this round. Um, I think that covers it. Yes. So let's get started. Um, keep an eye on the chat, everyone. Our first group of speakers are, are Renata, Rashi, and Parminda. I use first names, if that's all right with everyone. We all know each other on first name terms off screen. Uh, and then we'll be followed by Thomas, Michelle, and Paul uh, when he gets here. So I will assert the three minute rule. Remember the question one more time for the record. What if AI is actually the way it's going, the way we're developing at a systemic level? Uh, what if all these trajectories are undermining the sustainability of human rights and our planet? So uh, not simply a rhetorical question. So without too much further ado, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Renata Avilia. Your three minutes starting from now. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm sad I cannot be in Katowice, but since I just have three minutes, I have to rush with all the ideas. And the first provocation I have is the, the, that what if is a, it is a mirror, is a reflection of our abandonment and undermining of the multilateral system and the principles the, the principles, the, the foundation, foundational principles of the United Nations. The, 70 years ago, a miracle happened, a global miracle happened, that consensus and commitment to human rights, to placing the human at the center and to placing development, peace, and the fulfillment of all the potential of humanity in the hands of a multilateral system that was equal that was participatory, that was democratic in essence, that would allow all the difference to converge to a work towards uh, uh, you know, achievable goals. And now it seems that all this commitment is diluted and is undermined by alternative systems that of just groups, fragmented groups of, of countries that abandon this system as the, as the backbone my pledge will be to bring back the system into relevance and to make it ours and to bring back a collective vision of AI into the system and to update and upgrade the, pre the foundational principles of the United Nations and, and uh, to reflect the challenges of the technology challenges of our times. And while doing so, also transfer those principles as the building principles of the technologies of the future things like inclusiveness, privacy by design, inclusiveness by default uh, um, um, could be reflected in the technologies of tomorrow. And those technologies of tomorrow built in a collective vision could be like the keys to unlock the, the real potential of technology as a public good and as a key tool to solve the complex problems that we are facing as a humanity. And let's make all those principles not only our, the principles of our planet, but also interplanetary. Let's not allow uh, those uh, big uh, tech oligarchs to 
define the principles and the rules for the other planets uh, as, as part of our system in the years to come, in the centuries to come. That's my first intervention. Let's bring back multilateralism and let's, and let's update it uh, to reflect our, our vision of a digital future. Thank you so much. You were under the three minutes, so you have set the bar. Thank you, Renata, for that opening challenge. Uh, moving now to Rashi Seksana, um, uh, you have the floor. I'm going to try and attempt if I can actually share my my slides. Can can you all see my slides? Oh, wait, this is the yes, opening. you can. Maybe a little bigger. A little bigger. Okay. I'm going with you. Now? No? No, not yet. I'll try sharing, uh, Rashi. If you begin, I'll get the share screen. Yeah, actually, that, that, that would be great. I could, yeah, I could just, just go ahead then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, so, yeah, um, I, I do think that artificial intelligence is um, increasing, uh, increasingly becoming the wheel decision maker of our times. Um, it is a general purpose technology that a lot of countries are uh, certainly trying to push. Um, it does have considerable potential um, and does play a role uh, with, within 134 targets approximately when it comes to the SDGs. Uh, however, with new technology, you have uh, new developments, um, regulatory obligations, legal ethical frameworks, which have been a risk to our society. Um, and it is um, uh, AI can be an inhibiting factor for 59 targets under the SDGs. Um, and some of the risks uh, to human rights and freedoms are the disparities between developed and developing countries, um, being very Eurocentric, um, data colonialism, risks of warfare, and also uh, the risks of algorithms making decisions on behalf of you. Um, there's also a disproportionate impact, negative impact on the marginalized groups, um, where there's no explicit input, uh, but AI finds relationship that's unaware, which can be discriminatory, for example, correlation between zip codes and socioeconomic status. Um, there's also a general lack of transparency and explicability. Um, it's also hard to understand, uh, explain, and regulate AI. So what do we really do here? Um, well, my pledge, or rather some of the work that we've been doing with UNESCO uh, at the IFA Policy Foundation is moving towards and adopting uh, for a multi-stakeholder approach um, in AI policymaking. Uh, so some of the, I think the slides that um, Marianne has shared where we do think that multi-stakeholder approaches using deliberation are the solution. Uh, it ensures that consensus can be reached uh, with ethical conundrums. Um, it also raises uh, awareness and builds capacity for a lot of other stakeholders that do not have a role in AI, especially with citizens. Um, and the policy framework can also be flexible if you have sustainable um, feedback mechanisms. Uh, but of course, in practice, um, translating it into theory can be difficult. It requires effort, vision, financial resources. Um, maybe you can go back to the previous slide. I'm afraid your, your time is up. Sure. No, these, these are just testimonials of some of the participants that we had. Renata was also kind enough to join us. But yeah, that's uh, my pleasure. Thanks so much. Um, uh, all speakers will have a chance to retrace their steps and develop um, their ideas. So Rashi, thank you so much. Uh, moving on now to uh, Parminder Jeet Singh from IT for Change. Parminder, the floor is yours. Thanks, Marian. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, Renata and uh, Rashi already brought up the issue of how AI principles are, are developed. Going back to your core question, I think AI is very dangerous under quotes as the trajectories are moving, but I always believe the technology is what you make of it. This AI, and at least till now, is still AI that we make. Uh, we may be overtaken, but I'm still not thinking of it. And who is making this AI, and therefore who should then make its AI is most important. And I also go and focus on the economic distribution aspects of it. Uh, Kai Fu, Fu Li, who is you know a great uh, AI scientist and a businessman, spoke so beautifully in an article in New York Times when he said that Internationally, there will be just two countries who would have all the AI power and 
the other countries would have no options other than to be kind of dominions by taking money in exchange of giving up your, their data. And that's kind of colonization is going to happen. And this guy is really somebody who knows his data. Now the issue of when Renata says going back to the UN, and I think the biggest thing is that we should start li listening to public interest actors more. In the last 20 years, we have said, listen to business, listen to technical community. Probably now we say, please listen to business less and the technical community less because they have certain interest in AI and listen to the public interest actors more. And it's not that that AI principles are not being developed now. In the next one and a half minutes, I will tell you what is happening now. What is called the multi-stakeholderism of current things. OECD, CDIP, Committee on Development of, uh, of Digital Policy, uh, in 2018 developed a set of principles which were adopted by OECD as soft law, as legal instruments. It's on their legal instruments page of OECD. And they made those AI principles or norms. After four months, just four months, G20, and I hate India was a part of it, actually adopted them. And they were not subtle at all in their adoption. They didn't just use the language. They just said, we adopted, adopt them. And the OECD principles are in the annex that uh, brutally uh, uh, non-participatory. And that not being enough, then they launch this AI partnership, which now wants all countries to take up those principles and so-called multi-stakeholder community to take up those principles. And it is very clear, again, the partnership says, why is the secretariat with the OECD? Because they want OECD to keep the leadership. Now, I remind you that 10 years back, India made a proposal in the UN to develop exactly the same system of OECD policy making into the UN. Just the number of countries changed, nothing else. And the whole world shouted that that was multilateralism, but everybody calls OECD's making as multi-stakeholderism exactly cut paste same system there's a central council of gov government nominees who make it and their stakeholders who give advice uh, here i stop uh, at about uh, three and i'm ready to come back thank, thank you. you thank you so much paminda we can always come back uh, to elaborate thank you so we have our three opening comments uh the gauntlet has been thrown down we have three more speakers for their opening statements uh to our provocative question what if uh, I'd like to begin the next group of three uh, with Ambassador Schneider. So, uh, Thomas, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Marion. I hope you can all hear me. That's Perhaps a little louder because um, I think we need to get quite close to the mics. Okay. Thank so you. I try to speak louder. So, like Parminda has said, every technology, as history has shown, can be used for good and bad purposes, from steam and combustion engines to uh, radio and television. We've all witnessed... Uh, positive uses and, and negative uses. So in this respect, I think that AI is not uh, different from other technologies. Of course, it is possible that AI may have an e even more profound disruptive character than previous uh, technological innovations. But like, like also like Parminda has said, AI, what, what, what is AI is useful depends on us human beings and our political representatives and on whether we agree on what we should like to use AI for and what possible ne necessary legal and other guardrails uh, should be given to this technology. And in this regard, much has already been done. We have now hundreds of sets of principles and guidelines and soft law instruments by national institutions, by international organizations like UNESCO, OECD has been mentioned, Council of Europe and others, and also by NGOs and by companies themselves. So. In many areas of, uh, of, of the world, the ideas about how to enhance regulation on AI. With regard to Europe, which is where I come from, there is a discussion in, on EU level on a draft legislation on AI. We are not a member of the EU, I'm Swiss. But we uh, actively participate in the Council of Europe, where the, there is the plan and the pre-work has been done to uh, elaborate a framework convention on the use of AI which is following a little bit the example of the Oviedo Convention on Biomedicine that sets out the broad principles based on the Council of Europe values uh, that should be applicable to AI. But there's something that we should not forget in my view, is that AI is not being developed in a vacuum. We all have our general legal frameworks, national and international ones, that are applicable to AI. This goes for our legal frameworks to protect human rights, including privacy, freedom of information, non-discrimination, human dignity, right to self-determination, and, and other rights that the people have and that are, that are already in consumer protection issues that are already there in our traditional system. So 
the main point in our view is if you want uh, to prevent AI from being used for wrong purposes, it is important that people in all countries in the world fight for respect of rule of law, democracy, and the human rights in general. They fight for a strong legal basis of their rights, and that will probably be the most efficient. And then we can build on what is necessary, particularly for AI. In Switzerland, in my country, we basically have the general approach that we try to keep a legal system as technologi technologically neutral as possible. So we try to have a solid set of clear principles that then are applied to concrete cases and concrete technologies, um, also by courts that are trained to decide on cases based on these principles and are, are trained to apply the principles of adequacy and proportionality and common sense. And we prefer to update existing sectoral laws in the health sector, in the automotive sectors, on working rights with necessary AI components instead of producing overarching but maybe too detailed and too time-bound AI laws that cover too many issues and are not possible to implement or lagging already behind when they are implemented. Thank you so, so much, Thomas. I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut you off there. Okay. <laughs> we, I don't know if you heard our little, ho little um, hoot no, there. No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, sorry. Not visible, That's okay. I thought that was a great way way to um to segue into our next speaker. Um, some very provocative points there as well from uh, from uh, uh, Ambassador Schneider. So uh, moving on now to our, uh, our our speaker Michelle Thorne from Mozilla. Michelle, uh, welcome. It's lovely to have you here. Um, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Yes, and thank you so much also to the organizers for making space and putting this topic on the agenda. Um, I'd also like to thank Kathleen Berger, who was the former sustainability steward at Mozilla, who really helped articulate the positions I'm going to share. Um, so yes, to your provocative question, um, I think right now we're seeing ourselves, of course, in this moment of a green recovery. Um, you know, the governments are trying to find a way to get growth after the pandemic while addressing the climate crisis. For example, we see the European Green New Deal, and this is a, a kind of an effort to push environmentally friendly technologies and economic growth decoupled from resource use. So my first question is like, is that possible? <laughs> um, and also we see AI presented as one of these solutions to help fuel this green, green transition. And I also wanna ask, is that true? <laughs> um, so as people have, as the other panelists have alluded to, you know, AI can be used for all sorts of different ways. We do see many human-centric uses of AI that can help mitigate the climate crisis, things that will help medicine, food production, traffic management, many of these different things. But at the same time, we're also seeing, you know, any implementation of AI is really relying on massive and growing volumes of data that has to be stored and processed that has a significant environmental impact. And furthermore, we're seeing AI systems used to speed up fossil fuel extraction and the burning of those fuels are already causing millions of deaths each year and contributing to the rising global temperatures. Plus that's all in addition to the well-documented harms of AI around discrimination and bias, undermining privacy and violating trust online. So I would posit at a minimum, we should be talking about more transparency around AI's environmental impact that includes emissions, but also land and water use and you know, these human impacts. Um, and so hopefully later in the panel, um, we can share some mechanisms that might help account for those harms. Thank you, and hopefully under three minutes. Thank you, Michelle. Well, that was two minutes. Thank you so much. Now we have our, our last opening speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Paul Nemitz from the uh, European Commission for, for getting here from your meeting. Really appreciate it. Uh, we have three minutes. Um, I will uh, enforce the three minutes. Uh, and then we're going to ask the audience, particularly in the room, if they have any uh, interventions also to time limits, because uh, Michael will have a walking mic and, uh, and then we'll throw it open for a little bit. And then we'll try and get down to some nitty gritty. So, uh, Mr. Nemitz, welcome, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, and as you know, uh, the European Commission has uh, proposed um, a set of horizontal rules uh, for artificial intelligence as part of a broader package of legislation, uh, which sets uh, in a democratic fashion a frame for uh, big tech. And not only big tech, but uh, the world in which we live and in the future even more, namely the technology dominated world. 
So what we see here happening in Brussels is really a move from Essex talk and uh, you know the old talking about self-regulation and so on, all these things which have not worked. And the best example, of course, is the charger, the mobile phone charger where industry promised 20 years ago to come up with one model and they never did. So now on that one, we also need re um, regulation and laws. And um, I would say uh, what's happening in Brussels is really um, a renaissance of democracy in the sense that you know we have in Parliament the important debates on how to shape technology and the law is recognized again as the most um, noble instrument of how democracy expresses itself. And that is actually also the difference to China where you have no democracy and also the difference to Washington where it seems to be impossible to come up with laws in the public interest in Congress. So we are trying to do it in Brussels in a way which is good for business because we are maintaining a coherence in the internal market, but which is also good for its citizens. Let me close with this. Um, um, pleading for sectoral laws is the classic uh, approach which uh, industry has always taken on GDPR and again also on uh, AI and so on. But from the point of view of citizens, we first need, let's say, strong pillars of clear common rules which apply across the board. For example, on AI, that people know when AI is talking to them, when they get messages sent or when they hear a voice, they need to know, is this a human or is this a machine? And this must be a horizontal rule which applies everywhere. And then of course, on the basis of the horizontal rules, there can be differentiations by sector, no doubt, but we have to make the intellectual effort to keep the tech world in which humans are living manageable for humans. And that requires that we have common and if possible simple rules for people which protect them which they can rely on and i would say which help them to accept that our world becomes ever more dominated by technology if we don't go this way if we make also the rules complicated by splitting them up only by sector i fear we will have in democracy a problem of acceptance of uh, this technology trend which we are faced with Thank you so much. Yes, so these are the opening statements. Uh, we have um, a walking mic in the room. Oh, there we go. We have a walking mic in the room. Uh, and uh, Michael, if anybody wants to intervene on the audio, uh, this is their chance from audiences and also in the Zoom room. Uh, this is a really wide ranging set of opening statements. So I have put up on the chat for all of us because I will ask our speakers, what do each of us mean when we speak of artificial intelligence? From the UNESCO report to the APC uh, Global Information Society 2019 uh, edition of the Guest Watch, uh, we have machine learning, we have uh, phrases like computers acting intelligently, uh, we have phrases like uh, uh, systemic forms of artificial intelligence that are bound with surveillance, um, automation. We all know, particularly uh, uh, Mr. Namitz, given his work on, on the ethics of AI and our work like that, we all know that definitions are at the core. But I think, uh, particularly from our technical community representative, Michelle, um, how Mozilla, perhaps, for instance, understands AI in, uh, in everyday speech and also in specific projects. Uh, so are there any questions from the floor before I ask our speakers and audience to answer my simple conceptual definitional question? Does anybody in the room have a question or a comment? Uh, Marianne, it, it uh, does not seem to be anyone in the room who has a uh, question. Okay. Anyone on the Zoom room? Because I understand we have some law students from um, Greenwich who might be uh, itching to put questions to some of the speakers. While we're waiting for those, I'd like to ask Michelle, is it okay to start with you? Um, Mozilla has some very tantalizing, interesting projects around AI. So what do you, you and your team mean when you're talking about uh, this uh, big umbrella term? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, you might find we don't have such a unified <laughs> approach even within the organization because there are people who take a much more, I would say, a technical definition and then others are using it to speak more broadly of kind of some of the newer waves of digital development. So I share this <laughs> knowing that we there's not such a unified voice. Um, but um, I do find that we're seeing that um, talking about AI has been one of the ways in which we can talk about some of the challenges we see of the internet today showing up, especially as other speakers have talked about the ways in which um, 
it's less clear how decisions are being made and who's responsible for those decisions, you know, things about explainability and the ability to audit um, the systems that has turned, that's been one of the major focuses we've had when we think about um, how we can make AI more trustworthy. Um, so I don't know if that's such a helpful definition, but I'm happy to add in the chat some of the work Mozilla has done on the space if people would like to learn more. Oh, please do so. Uh, that'd be fantastic, Michelle. Uh, you mentioned the word decision making. I'm wondering if that's a key word. Uh, this workshop is uh, looking to connect three huge areas, AI and all it might mean, uh, sustainability in terms of our physical environment, but also our built environment and human rights. So back to the initial definitional uh, question, anyone from our speakers want to follow up with Michelle on uh, some conceptual points? Paminda? No? Uh, Renata? I never say no to- No, you never say no to the floor, I know. <laughs> Off you go. And to, to your request. And I was very happy, and I just put in the chat, to hear the spirited defense by the EU rep of the need of horizontal rules vis-a-vis -vis only sectoral rules uh, in digital policy making, because I'm simply reminded of the four years I spent in the UN working group on enhanced cooperation, just discussing and arguing that globally we need a body for uh, horizontal rules and the EU rep and all European country reps and Ambassador Thomas, I won't want to put him in a corner, was there to bear me out on this, arguing to me that no horizontal rule making is needed in the digital space, sectoral rule making is enough. Now, I am not, uh, let's, we have moved on, at least now agree that AI is too strong a force of which there are huge amount of common characteristics as the EU rep was saying, which have to be dealt by in a common manner. The health guys cannot deal with it. The education guys can't deal with it. There have to be horizontal rules on AI and on data. And I remind you, UNCTAD has called for a global governance framework for data. And I'm very sure in a year or two, they would ask for a global framework on AI. Yes, AI becomes the most potent economic force and they deal with economics and trade. And I think let's rise to the occasion leave behind the differences and agree that all countries should sit together at the same level and not OECD alone or EU alone and talk and make and not already say China is not going to agree, uh, you know, Russia is not going to agree post war we did it and that's what beautifully Renata started with. Now we are almost in that bad a situation with AI around and let's sit together and if we discuss we we'll definitely will agree to uh, many norms. Thank you. Marianne, there's a there's a question here on the floor. Yes, good to hear, Michael. Just uh, before I move to Michael with the mic, uh, please thank you, uh, Paul Nemitz, for putting up um, an official uh, set of conceptualizations around AI. Very, very useful. A, B, and C. It's up on the chat, everyone. Uh, so, Michael, uh, please um, who, uh, hand the mic. Could you please introduce yourself for the record? And you will have no more than three minutes once uh, you can start. Mike. Thank you. Um... I am Mamal Moussan and I'm the Dutch United Nations Youth Delegate. And I had a I'm clear, for... well, sorry. Yes, uh, could you I come not... a little closer to the mic? Thank you. Yes, of course, yes, I can. Am I more audible right now? Yep, you're great. Okay, good. Well, I am Manal Moussan and I'm the Dutch United Nations Youth Delegate on Human Rights and Security. And I heard you speak, Mr. Paul, about having simple rules that, that are easy to understand for also young people who aren't part of the tech world. And I can't help but think, what do you think would be uh, the right rule for young people to help you in creating these simple and understandable rules? Thank you, yes, uh, yeah. oh, feel free to respond. <laughs> yeah, uh, the answer which uh, um, I like is that the texts which we produce when read with innocent eyes, meaning not with the eyes of experts, must be understandable. But that doesn't mean that these are simple comic texts. I would say they must be understandable after two or three times intensive reading of the whole text and, you know, going back to specific formulations and a real intellectual effort. I mean, you know, the world today is complex and unfortunately, you know, laws are sometimes very, very detailed, but they must be written in such a way that a normal person with serious effort can understand it. And I think, um, you know, that's, that's what we're trying to do. Let me say a word about definitions. 
definitions um, for political purposes and also in law will never be as clear and crisp as scientists and academia or for that matter engineers or business will expect. Why? Because first, legal texts are texts of compromise. In a democratic process, you often have really thousands of amendments in the European Parliament, often thousands of amendments. And to get a majority, you know, you have to work on the text. And it's not a scientific product. It's a product of democracy. But second, uh, the function of a definition for a scientist and for an engineer um, uh, is a very different one than a definition in law. Uh, in law, the definition, for example, of artificial intelligence in the Artificial Intelligence Act, first of all, only means a technology falls within the scope of this law. It doesn't mean that somebody has to do anything. It only means this law falls within the scope of the law. And then you have to continue on reading. And for example, in the Artificial Intelligence Act, then you come to the risk pyramid which differentiates between four levels of risks. And only after you've understood that your AI falls both under the definition and falls within the higher risk groups, then you come to quite a number of obligations. And I would say rightly so, because if you put a risk into the world, uh, you know the risk has to be mitigated in the public interest. So the fact that an initial definition of a law is rather broad often serve simply the purpose of creating transparency and creating attention among the actors. But it doesn't mean that immediately, you know, you can't do anything and, oh my God, we are, we are under the AI law. Absolutely not. So I would say, you know, let's relax a little bit about uh, this definition. I would say, generally speaking, it's better to have broader definitions. The key then is to look what obligations follows from falling within the scope of the definition. And that is a more differentiated discussion. Thank you for that very important distinction between uh, legal definitions and uh, everyday uh, social philosophical uh, definitions. Uh, but that begs the question of how do we get things to connect? We've been talking about horizontal lines of consultation and inclusion. So here I'd like to bring Renata in as a lawyer and an activist. What about 360 degree approaches? Why is it so difficult to have, uh, to, why is it always we read certain sorts of authorships um, talking about culture and society, then the legal people talk about the legal things and the technical people talk about the technical things. How is it that we can't connect and how can we? I think Renata, this question is for you. You know, you know, like I have been like, you know, exploring this for a long time. It's a lot of talking and talking and talking. And then at the end of the line, at the end of the line of all decisions is the is a, a, a humble and shadowy department that ends up deciding a lot of things and has very little scrutiny and that's the procurement space uh, i think that the states and uh, if i think of the public sector the public sector can shift uh, a lot of the, the industry the, the decisions in principal the deci principal decisions in the public sector can you know like uh, shift uh, things like sustainability, things like um, um, how obsolete, uh, obsolete uh, our technology is and, you know, like by just shaping the rules on how they acquire things. And it is not only the state buying things for itself, but it's also all the aid sector, you know, international aid sector. And I think that, you know, like it has been neglected and how if we look at the big budgets and if we look at the way that governments all over the world and aid agencies are uh, acquiring technologies and deploying systems that are like, absolutely disconnected from uh, human rights principles and are absolutely disconnected uh, from, a, you know, a coherent vision on sustainability, inclusiveness, uh, 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 and are they just driven by uh, prices and the best offer or whatever you get as a gift from a, a richer country. If we redefine the way that we acquire technologies, then I think that we, it is a very interesting starting point because it will shift and you know, it, will, it will permeate in different, like at the local level, at the municipal level, at, at different, like, you know, uh, across the, the entire education sector, health sector and so on. 
I think that uh, it is just an idea. We are going, as you said, that we have to say that what we are going to do, we are going to exercise a scrutiny in the way that our governments acquire things. And we are going to uh, shift the priorities by, you know, like uh, tightening the rules of how more our money, public money is spent. Initial thoughts. Thank you. Uh, we have an audience hand raise. Uh, just if, just let me get back to that hand very quickly. Procurement, deciding what things get purchased, deciding uh, what AI uh, technology deployment is going to be deployed in an institution in the workplace. I wonder if uh, uh, Thomas Schneider and Michelle Thorne would like to respond to this very good concrete example of what we're dealing with. AI automation is already there out there to, from the classroom through to the assembly line and everywhere in between, including this meeting. Uh, Michelle from Mozilla and Thomas, given that the Swiss government did note the role of private enterprise in its guidelines. Uh, and if procurement is so important, where do human rights and environmental sustainability fit in if we hand it over to uh, the private sector, just to be provocative? Michelle first and then Thomas. Thank you. I'm, Renata, I really appreciate this point around procurement because I agree it's where a lot of these issues come to a head and also where a lot of direction is made. Um, and so actually, I think Mozilla has this interesting hybrid approach where it both makes technology but once is has no shareholders. So we're kind of in the trying to be in the service of the public here. And I think with the, and one of the things we're trying to prioritize is also transparency and accountability. So I think this sits hands in hands with like what we think, what procurement, good procurement looks like. So more transparency around that, but also guidelines that are for technology in the public interest. Um, and so I agree, there's a lot of ways we could see that happen, local levels and national levels um, and in different other programs. So, um, I, I support this idea that focusing on procurement is a big one, um, and it's, it, pushes, it pushes companies. So that's a good place for leverage, especially for civil society and for government. Thank you. We have Alka Pals, but we have, oh yes, Anna. So, and before um, Anna and then Alka, I'd like to hear from, if I may, if Thomas, you're willing to respond to this tricky uh, tension between human rights law, uh, the environment sustainability and private enterprise, which is where a lot of AI is happening at the moment. Thomas. Yes, thank you. And, and I think it's, it's clear that uh, AI is already over the place. There's enough research by groups like Algorithm Watch and others that show where uh, already now in the public sector AI is, is used. And, and uh, so it's not just procurement, it's also procurement, but it's basically all, all over the place. And, and with regard to this, again, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we as states, at least those that have signed the European Convention on Human Rights, the government is obliged to protect the rights of the people, to protect privacy, to protect the, the other rights. This is a positive obligation and we have to, of course, make sure that we have a legal basis to also oblige our companies and industry to respect the rights of the people. And this is fundamental and this needs to be implementable. If we have nice papers and compacts and, and declarations, but you have no means of enforcing it, that the people have no right to tell the government that I have the right and you are obliged to protect my rights. This is Charles Alcher's nice word. So again, uh, but of course, and I'm, I'm with Paul there, there are, and with all of you, that there are cross-cutting issues like transparency, like having a, a, a human being in the loop, on the loop, depending on, 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 on there may be some, with some variations, on having people know what, 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 who is talking to them, on having redress mechanisms and so on and so forth. There are some elements where you can come up with cross-cutting issues. This is also why we support the work of the Council of Europe on this frame, uh, framework convention. But that is not enough and you will not be able to solve everything in AI specific regulation because you will never, you will always lack behind. So you need to have a sectoral and a horizontal approach at the same time. And this is nothing new that I'm saying to Parminder, you have, you have both. If you look at the WISIS declaration and if you look at human rights, this is horizontal. It's not just sectoral, but it, you need to have both. Thank you. Thanks very much. We have a queue forming. We have Anna, we have Alka. We have Wolfgang, is that correct? And we then have Parminder. And Michael, did your hand up for yourself or? 
No, just, we, it's for, we have another person that's been waiting for the queue as well here in the room. Oh, okay. So can they be one, two, three, four? Okay. Is that okay? So um, Anna, would you like to take the mic and I'll start the clock? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I am from uh, Moje Państwo Foundation in Poland, uh, where we are um, focusing on introduction AI in public sector. And uh, here, uh, Michelle mentioned about transparency. And I have a question. Uh, if anyone has um, a solution, how to achieve transparency, if we talk about public sector uh, who is using AI uh, in the connected with, uh, you know, uh, public security roles, uh, because uh, many, um, we have many uh, cases uh, when we want to uh, get some information about how AI is using in a public sector. And uh, most of the cases we hear uh, that uh, we don't, uh, uh, we can't give you this information because, uh, uh, because of the uh, public security or uh, public interest. And how do you know, um, uh, resolve this problem because where is the boundaries of the public sector uh, rules and where is the boundaries uh, between you know human rights to get access to the public information uh, and the uh, you know uh, public interest or something else just it's my note for this uh, topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that links to the issue around procurement, public sector, private enterprise, and these tricky relationships. Uh, tricky as in uh, on an everyday level. Um, we have next in the uh, speaking queue, Alka Paz. Would you like to take the mic, Alka? And the video, if we can see you, if that's all right. Otherwise, we'll move through to Parminda and the person I'm waiting in the room. Well, just quickly, there has been. Uh, can somebody in the room who was before Alka can can she? Oh, speak sure. Alka, Alka hasn't responded. So um, let's. Uh, who 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 is it in the room? Off you go. Go ahead. Hi, yeah, please um, feel free. Okay, my name is Andrews Bass. I'm a um, global ambassador of peace, and also I'm a human rights consultant. I have a question from a group who texted me is a uh, Fire the Lancy Foundation in New York. Um, they said. We have a problem already. We're talking about digital resources, digital money, digital peace of treaty, digital communication, digital empowerment. People have already got challenges and the third world country or developed country to understand. If we're talking about the dream, how that dream will be possible in developed country with the AI implementation? How that's going to help them? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, we might need to think about that uh, question, uh, how to respond to that. Could we have um, Parminda, I think, would you like to take the floor? And then we'll ask our speakers to respond to our question from the, yeah. And the, yeah so, and the, so I, thanks, uh, Mariana. I wanted to come at the time that procurement was being discussed. And I think procurement otherwise is a very important instrument and we have fought for it in many technical areas. But remember when large digital AI companies are concerned, they are just too powerful. They have just too powerful offerings, almost often free offerings, but procurement level, city, mayor's level, et cetera, are not very powerful to resist them. I know a case of a US city mayor who handed over entire transportation to Google because Google was just giving such an attractive offer. And so unless they are bound by policy from the top to what to do and not to do, Procurement becomes weak in front of uh, large companies. And while I'm having the mic and there should be certain political tension in all good political debates, uh, Ambassador Thomas talked about this is was horizontal. And I question why developing countries should be content with a 16 year old horizontal framework and why they should not be making AI uh, norms and data norms, uh, platform governance norms right now in 2021. Uh, which OECD is making is the question and not whether this is was inclusive or not. And I also know that this is plus 20 is going to come in four years and the drama will unfold in many, many ways, which would again exclude developing countries 
from global digital policy making and be uh, ready and watch this space. What happens as we go towards uh, VCs plus plus 20 in four years? Thank you. Thank you, Parminda. Alka, you have the floor. Three minutes, no more. Thank you very much. Now, I'll keep it within a, a three minutes. My name is Alka Alka Paz. I'm working uh, for KPMG as consultant AI and trusted analytics. And I also want to give up a little bit of a different approach and like the bottom up from civil society influencing the public debate, but also um, in that respect, uh, enabling a private sector on um, taking responsibility themselves. So without, uh, without any policy needed. Um, and I do guess that a public debate that we're forming um, is really important. And if we create an AI, is, uh, or AI system, um, this sh uh, should have a good rep representation of, um, of the whole public, uh, actually, um, while training the data, etc. cetera. Um, and if that's being formed and implemented, you also have to review if the system that uh, has been created by the company is representing different stakeholders. And in that respect, also um, the system should be, uh, be able to be audited. Um, and that's uh, also, uh, also really important. After that, you get uh, the feeling, okay, what we're doing, that's progressing. And um, there might be improvement, but when you are able um, to have responsible AI, so if the uh, AI system that it's been created is transparent, um, then um, yeah, this whole responsible AI discussion can also be created bottom up instead of top down. Thank you very much. Thanks, as always, Alka, uh, brief and to the point. We have, um, could uh, hands be taken down? I'm, I'm going to assume, Parminda, that's an old hand up. Michael, anyone? I see uh, Jacques Benglinger is uh, with us. Uh, would you like to take the mic and then followed by Thomas? Jacques? Yeah, my name is Jacques Benglinger. I am co-secretary of the Swiss IGF. And uh, I would just follow up what uh, okay, uh, was uh, extemporating. Uh, which, but to bring in a, a different point, which is, I mean, there is legislation, there is soft law, but there is also private uh, initiative, and in Switzerland in particular, um, there is some kind of a public-private cooperation on uh, setting up a uh, trust seal. And uh, this would also be something that uh, I'm lacking so far in the discussion. So uh, certified trust, on products and or services, this could well mitigate the tensions between uh, just uh, sector, um, uh, sectoral laws uh, versus uh, horizontal regulations. Thank you very much. Um, yes, very practical uh, suggestions here in terms about what to do, how to join the dots horizontally, sectorally. Um, no one yet has raised the challenge, my 360 degree challenge. Uh, maybe we're using different metaphors. Thomas, uh, the mic is yours. Thank you, Marion. <clears throat> and uh, I think one point that, that I fully agree with Parmin is that no government or no company per se uh, are doing the right thing or the good thing, or they are necessarily uh, uh, anthroposophic beings. So, and, and on the contrary, and I, I, I'm a historian by nature, so history has proven to me that anybody who has power, even if it, it got it with, uh, or he or she got it with good intentions, has the tendency at some point in time to abuse power. So I think uh, we, are, we are all together on this. So we need a framework that creates incentives to make companies, governments, but also individuals to do the right thing and not the wrong thing. And then we can debate about how to get there. So I think this is where we, where we agree. And there, there are different ways of, of getting there. I just wanted to strike that. And there are more like detailed uh, single uh, ideas, like creating a trust label. But that's not so easy. With, it's easier with a product, with a hardware product, than with software. The algorithm then changes itself uh, on a second basis. Uh, so 
some things are easily said but not so easily then implemented in a way that they work so this is and of course i think we should this is a necessary debate so that we try and find out what works and one important point is what works in a country like switzerland may not work in another country so it's also good to hear the voices of people from the global south uh, because they may have a different regulatory environment they may have different human rights conditions economic conditions and and we should in particular also put the stress on those who are maybe less able to defend themselves through the classical structures how can we support them to understand what is going on and to fight for their rights and fight for their visions thank you thank you thomas thank you yes uh very clear uh Minda, your hand is up um, yeah, I basically just wanted to flag up a question that uh, was in the chat ar earlier by Wolfgang, and I just wonder if Wolfgang would like to ask that question directly or if I should read it. Oh, I see Wolfgang's on video already. Wolfgang, welcome. Thank you very much, Minda, that encouraging me. <laughs> yes, I'm not the, I don't feel as the big expert, but what I see here is that thanks to the civil society, awareness has been created and thanks to a number of actors, uh, solutions are being sought through codes, uh, guidelines, principles, and so on. What we will have to live with seems to be a period of a fragmented response from different sides, uh, national, regional, and uh, my question would be, how can we uh, bring it really to the global level, to the, uh, to the multilateral level, uh, in order to be as ex inclusive as possible, and at the same time, uh, guaranteeing some uh, compliance uh, with uh, general uh, principles, which actually everybody can agree to. Thank you. Uh, Renata. Um, floor is yours. Yeah, um, basically, I think that uh, I think that when we uh, talk about advanced technologies, as Parminda pointed out, uh, the those making them are very few actors, and I think that the Pegasus software, like a scandal, uh, it is showing is is going to show how uh, you know uh, technologies made in the global north are impacting globally. So, and, uh, and, and how a little bit of political will and commitment not to, uh, of, of the, you know, elevating universal standards for the technologies that we produce, the same way that we did it with cars, the same the way that we did it with other, like, you know, technologies in the past is going to have global impact. But oh, I also think there is a moment of accountability because if, uh, if, uh, uh, such a scandal. I mean, we are still dealing with the harm and the and, uh, of uh, surveillance technologies. Did you know, like almost you know, ten years uh, since uh, WikiLeaks started uh, exposing the spy files, and then Snowden came with the, re the other revelations, and now with the Facebook files. If we if we don't tackle this in time for AI, the uh, damage can be irreversible. And so I I, like, I think that the, I think that uh, it is necessary. Uh, we cannot wait. I, I, I believe that we cannot wait wait for um, um, a global treaty. I mean, that would be the next step. But I think that uh, countries must immediately start addressing this. And if not, I think that I, I call upon a courageous country to become, you know, like as we did in the past with universal jurisdiction, uh, to become the country, to become the fora, so we can uh, start, like you know, litigating these cases. I know that it's a risky idea, but I, we need a place committing to accountability. Uh, and I think that uh, I think that we, if we have a jurisdiction and we start like to look into these cases uh, with the scrutiny of uh, an impartial uh, judge uh, or, or tribunal, uh, uh, we can you know fast forward the 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 safeguards that we need. Thank you, Renata. That's a good segue. We have around about half an hour left. I like we're, we're pretty much working on action points, but um, so we're going to ask our speakers to uh, think about uh, how we're going to connect these three areas uh, through the filter of our discussions about AI automation, uh, whether or not uh, we need, uh, well, not whether or not the idea that we need some litigation tools, we need some accountability protocols, 
and we need some understanding of uh, the incredibly unequal distributions of power uh, around uh, um, those who can afford uh, the research and development and those for whom uh, or to whom these tools are deployed. What about the school and the university that your kids go to, your grandkids go to, uh, with automated roles? With, there's the end of mine. I'm going to stop. Uh, so could, um, you know, really concrete examples about what we can do uh, at the everyday level. Uh, we've talked a lot globally. So schools, workplaces, kindergartens, uh, zoos, museums. How can we address this issue of enormous electricity consumption, enormous digital footprints, carbon footprints, uh, and yet um, somehow get the good out of AI without having it crush us underneath its extraordinary weight? So that's my provocative point. You can ignore me, but I'm going to start with uh, the backwards. Uh, Paul Namitz, Michelle, Thomas Schneider, and backwards that way for the, um, a round of uh, more formal interventions. What concrete action point for what concrete issue around AI would you want to promote today? Starting with uh, Mr. Namitz. Paul, off you go. Yeah, I think um, the you know, when we talk about concrete action points, uh, for me, uh, the most important concrete action point is that democracy can function well in relation to this very complex technology. And what does this mean? I wish that um, we get information from industry, which is really truthful, which is not lies or stories which are, uh, you know, spread because of an interest uh, related to selling the technology or making money with it or, uh, you know, a certain business model or a certain type of AI promoting this or that. I would think that the big tech companies, especially, they can afford, you know, they are bigger than many countries in this world. They can afford when they participate in a political process to be a real, you know, amicus democracy, uh, you know, a friend of democracy. And, uh, you know, they, they don't need to do what they do right now, which is just lobby for their business interests and so on. It's, it's so sad to see this. They, you know, they would not lose out a lot of money if they just honestly tell what's happening, how does this work, um, and, and, and not undermine the democratic process, you know, trying to soft wash regulation, uh, trying to make it meaningless, but, you know, really help that democracy can deliver because that's what we need today that's the most concrete thing we need we need to be able to show people that democracy can deliver also on these very complex issues of technology regulation thank you so uh not start with the technology start with the democratic human rights principle right. so technology needs to follow almost an oxymoron in the internet governance forum but let's hold on well it's that. called the primacy of democracy uh, over technology it's thank you actually so much. quite thank you so much point taken um and we will now move to michelle thorne seeing as you're there in mozilla please <laughs> your response if you have one yeah thank you um i'd love to return actually to the topic of ai's environmental impact and really remind us again of AI's, you know, intense water usage in drought prone areas, millions of liters of water being used a day, AI being used to fuel, fuel uh, speed up fossil fuel extraction, um, the emissions of just um, training AI models can be up to like the equivalents of like 300 international flights. So these are real impacts that our digital lives have. Um, and I want to highlight the shortcomings of the greenhouse gas emissions accounting, which is currently entirely voluntary for tech companies. Um, and tech companies are rarely actually publishing information about their um, about the greenhouse gases emitted from their digital products. So I wanted to share from Mozilla, we've attempted to actually measure this. Um, also, again, thank you to Kathleen Berger, my, um, who worked at Mozilla to, and led this work. And we realized at Mozilla, which is a fairly large company of like a thousand people, but 98% of our emissions actually come from the use of Firefox, come from the use of digital tools. And in the typical greenhouse gas accounting, those emissions aren't actually really, no one does things with those levels of emissions. And if you compare that to a company like Google or Apple or some of the other bigger players, they're gonna have these what's called scope three emissions that are gonna dwarf <laughs> what is the Firefox usage, just as, to give this an example. 
Um, and so what I think what we need, and speaking of action, <laughs> is to actually push for more mandatory reporting on these different scopes of emissions. Um, and one of the things that we're going to be doing is pressuring other tech companies to start to report on those. Um, and furthermore, expand the conversation around AI as environmental harms to not just focus on emissions, but also to put people at the heart of this and really talk about digital rights and climate justice as a ways to move these conversations forward. So I just wanted to share that and thank you for this incredible conversation. Thank you, Michelle. Um, do I hear your subtext? Your subtext is we need a radical redesign from all the big tech giants from the ground up of all their services so they're less energy uh, inefficient. I see Michael nodding and will Mozilla lead the way? You don't have to answer that. I just want it on the record because I'm a Firefox user. <laughs> okay, thank you. So moving on now to uh, uh, Thomas Schneider. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with regard to Paul's wish uh, that the tech companies should be nice, I don't think that they are better or worse than oil companies or, or uh, other, uh, I don't know, the car industry in Germany, whatever. They just try to make profit, which is, is, is they will not be nicer or less nice if we ask them to. I think we, we need to take our fate in, in our own hands. And again, on, in every country, uh, and this also goes for the, for the sustainability part. If we vote and elect people, presidents, that tell us, I will make you rich, uh, no matter what the cost for nature is, no matter what the cost for the global south is, then nothing will change. If we vote for politicians that will say, I will help us fight climate change, I will help fight this injustice, and so on, and if that, we then insist that once they are elected, they actually do it, then we have a chance. Then we have a chance to make sure that companies pay taxes where value is created, uh, we have a chance that they are forced to be environmentally sustainable, that negative effects are integrated in prices and so on. But we can't just hope for a benevolent dictator. We have to, and everybody, we have to be not egoistic. We have to fight for the common cause. Otherwise, nothing will change. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Your point's very well taken. Um, uh, Michael is reminding us in the chat, not every part of the world enjoys the sorts of democratic uh, representative democracies consultative democracies are that we are uh, very fortunate to be living in most of us. Um, yes, um, moving now to Parminda on this, uh, this uh, penultimate round of what to do, concrete point. Uh, Parminda, thank you. Yeah, what to do, <coughs> two concrete points. Uh, I, and I can carry on like a broken record saying again what I've been saying for 15 years. You need to get a global place. Now, those, those all those, uh, Disneyland things are over. We are in a serious space. We need to get a space where people come and talk. Stop giving the China China bogey. The China bogey has outlived its use. Get a place at UNESCO. People get and talk about education. At WHO, they get together and talk about health. We need a global place where everybody comes and talks about intelligence, uh, digital intelligence, about data, and develop uh, the the space develops research like UNESCO is doing, the SHO, WHO is doing, and develop soft norms, it will happen. And if you can't do that, you don't talk about democracy because you use the word democracy to kill global democracy. Everybody can see through that, uh, that thing. Don't fool, you're not fooling anyone by using the word democracy to kill democracy. The second part is, and again, we worked a lot on it. We, AI is so, so efficient that it will solve all problems. And we should therefore start sacrificing efficiency. We say that I know uh, concentrated AI is more efficient, but I'm going to break up AI into smaller pieces. And that's what breaking big tech is about. Even Biden is talking about it, how far he'll go, I don't know. We have written a paper, we have talked about not only platform being broken from the trading, which is done on the top of it, like Amazon and traders, which already happens in India. We say that big tech should be broken in certain manner that data collection should be separate from cloud computing, should be separate from AI, should be separated from consumer facing AI services. We have a full paper to break the AI along these technical chains like network neutrality. We have layers. Each layer has to be a separate company. So you have to get on to do that. And I'll connect this to the first question. No single country with him itself sacrifice efficiency because they think they will lose out. 
till all of them got together is a prisoner's dilemma thing got together and agreed to certain minimums and that agreeing can only be done at the un un level right now us allies are getting on one side and china is building another camp what do you think where are you going to end up the only way to end up is to get together and start trying a global democracy model around ai and digital uh, technologies thank you thank you pamina also are uh, very clear moving to rashi sasina yeah um, no, I've, I've been thinking about this, but I also think that in the global south, there isn't, I mean, we don't have any policies. We can talk about the global north, but I, perhaps we, what, what we do need to do is actually get people involved, uh, build capacity on the topic, explain and convince uh, the importance of participation. Uh, someone was talking about a bottom-up approach, also incentivize disadvantaged groups and determine community champions so that we actually understand and increase the overall ownership of AI and the impact that it has on society because um, a lot of civil societies across don't really understand how AI works and how it can affect their, uh, their way of life. Um, and perhaps some of the lessons that we learned from the, from the consultations that we had is that um, countries cannot work in silos. Uh, we really need to come together and borrow from each other's experiences. Um, we established a diverse and inclusive task, task force of group, group, group experts, um, learning from local and global examples, um, ensuring, as I said, participation and reaching on a consensus that leads towards concrete action and policies. And one really good example is the recent uh, Chile AI strategy, uh, which had participation from citizens. Um, they, they moved from, and for the first time, they also had a lot of civil society and academia getting involved. Um, so I think it is possible, but it really has to come from the top. Uh, there has to be incentive, there has to be budget and a time and horizon of the strategy uh, where you can also, uh, you know, kind of be open to finding the unusual suspects so that you can lead to and make effective use of consultations um, and procreation. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yes, exactly. So, Renata. Well, I, I, I don't have much left to say. I would just uh, say that I think that we also need to uh, focus on uh, countries uh, writing the new constitutions. And uh, countries like Chile uh, come to my mind, you know, like it's very, very exciting to see new constitutional processes in the uh, 21st century. And I think that the new constitutions writ written by citizens right now are a great opportunity to bring up these topics. I think that it's a, a, a very interesting bottom up way uh, to uh, showing um, that it doesn't matter that the technology is not yet there. It is a way to unlock the possibilities of the future because I mean, uh, general rules, we need to write general rules for the next hundred years and, and do not wait for the technology to arrive when all the decisions have been made somewhere else. Uh, very good point about the timing, Renata. Wolfgang Benedek, I see your hand up. Is this a new hand? Yes, indeed. Yes, um, I, I wanted to follow up a bit on what I said uh, before on the issue of compliance. I think that uh, there is uh, interest of tech companies, which, by the way, I'm missing on this panel, um, to um, show that uh, they are trustworthy, as has been said several times. And therefore, there are opportunities to strengthen the dialogue. Uh, there is the Congress, the US Congress, there's the European Parliament, and so on. So I think they should be questioned regularly on their activities. And the next step would then be also to institutionalize this in the form of oversight bodies, for example, voluntary or not so voluntarily created, but in which in an institutionalized way, this dialogue can uh, take place more regularly and uh, with uh, a number of actors from all over. So I think we need to think about practical steps uh, to go a step further uh, than just a regulation uh, by different sides, but uh, what can be done quickly and anytime, and partly is happening already, is to institutionalize uh, this transparency and this right to information. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So let's just take a moment. We have 15 minutes. We don't have to go to the bitter end, but I'm going to open it up to comments from anyone, including our wonderful team, Michael, Minda, um, any of the speakers. We've had, we've had trouble connecting the three main areas, I think, today, because it's almost too big. Uh, one thing's coming through with all the comments and all the input and all the amazing uh, information on the chat. It's about accountability and it's about where does one go if something goes wrong? And we're working at a very high level here though. What about back to the school? When they, uh, when they buy a free um, uh, tool that is basically collecting data about five-year-olds and automating what um, happens to what those five-year-olds see in their now increasingly digital online learning environments. Who does a concerned parent go to at the school, thinking back to connect procurement, to responsibility, to accountability, to decision-making, to democracy, and the most basic sense of everyday life? Do we go uh, to the various big tech brand names and say, we don't want your automated role tool, we don't want your... Um, 3D virtual world, if it's collecting data about my five-year-old and I have no control how or where that data is being used, or I have no control on the way in which my five-year-old's intellectual and cognitive capacities are being shaped by an algorithm. This is happening now today in classrooms and in universities right now. It's not robots, it's not science fiction. So those are the connections. Uh, any comments? That's my final comment to abuse my chair. Um, comments from the floor, we have an open floor now. Please just raise your hands or wave yeah. your hand. Paminda. Yeah, I think since you put the challenge to connect the three yeah. areas, I'm going to do that. AI, we have talked about a lot. In human rights, I hear a lot of things, and I was in an earlier meeting, he says, oh, HR rights, people are talking, but not talking about economic things. And I'd say, wait a minute, who told you that economic things are not a part of HR rights? And it's unbelievable that in the digital area, we simply think that political and civil rights are called HR rights, human rights, and rest is the rest of the world. Excuse me, it's not true. Labor rights are human rights. Uh, equality of uh, you know, uh, economic opportunities are human rights. Right for self-determination is a human right. Right to development is a human right. These are human rights. Once you start talking about these human rights, you really see the world is different. And connecting to the SDGs, the, the SDG 10 is about greater equality among people and among countries. And within that, the targets are that people have greater part, every country has a greater participation in they call it financial institutions, but at that time financial institutions were important. Today, digital institutions are important. So if you cut across, all of them are talking about the same thing. And one example of it is that India has done a report on communities ownership of data, and they have used the human right of self-determination, right to self-determination, where it is clearly said the country's natural resources are owned by that country and its communities, and they will determine and data and intelligence are social resources and similar things can be put around it. So I'm just connecting the three. And there is, as Renata started by saying that there is enough in existing governance systems, both institution wise and norms wise to root the current situation into that, but also innovate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, two from the floor. I'm just going to reset the timer to two minutes because um, are you done otherwise, do oh, wait a sec. Uh, <laughs> Okay, okay. Off we go. Alka. Start with Tapani. Since oh, sorry, this... Tapani. Yeah, can we, can we go to Tapani first since, since he, he hasn't spoken? Welcome, yet. Tapani. If that's okay. Sorry, sorry, Alka. Okay, hi, Maria. I'm Tapani Tarvanen from Electronic Frontier Finland. I just wanted to offer a couple of observations or insights on the nature of AI because the definitions were not forthcoming. I'm not going to define it, but a few observations. From first, from a computer programmer's point of view, AI differs from uh, normal programming in the sense that pro programmer does not understand how it works. They are not programmed to do a specific task. They are programmed to learn and then taught. And we don't quite, even the programmer cannot explain how it works within. It, this may not be an obvious distinction to people who don't understand how com programmers work in general, but it is significant. Okay. Another observation, that uh, AI system is arguably a system that makes decisions that are not decisions of any human being, actually. And in that sense, we have had AIs for a long time because companies are AI systems. 
they make decisions by rules that, uh, of course, are implemented by people within, but they are not decisions of any individual there. And there is a uh, something to think about. What exactly is AI? And of course, any organization, including our dynamic coalitions in AI, in this sense, who is making decisions? It's not any individual, but a set of rules that are being implemented by people and things that people make. Thank you. Thank you, Tapani. Thank you. So I have a queue there. I, it can be corrected if necessary. Uh, we have Alka, and then we have three people on the Zoom room. Thank uh, you Alka, very, please. Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Alka Pauls. Um, we, Marianne, you um, gave a good example of actually something that we don't want, and you may made the or create the example of a child uh, playing with toys and data is being collected. But maybe the problem is is that uh, actually the public doesn't really know that uh, those kinds of stuff is collected and a model is created. So a pos possible suggestion for me would be if you make that transparent or ask for uh, an external company to review algorithms or make them even public, uh, you could enable uh, the transparency. And if that would be put into some kind of policy, um, those decisions or those algorithm AI systems wouldn't even exist because then it could be that that's um, being marked controversial uh, and in that matter, the company um, would decide differently. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very good suggestion. Um, we now have a couple of people who haven't spoken yet in the Zoom room. Is it Bartoszek? Is that correct? Or have I slaughtered uh, your name? Yeah, my name is actually Mateusz. Oh, Mateusz. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Mateusz. Yes. Uh, hello. Good evening. Uh, I'm a recent law graduate in, in Poland and from a more legal point of view, I just wanted to point out that um, when we are talking about human rights, uh, the institutions that help us preserve human rights and serve to preserving human rights are courts and the justice system. And then what do we do when courts themselves and the justice system is a bigger, bigger picture? Uh, use artificial intelligence that can somehow make the court's decisions not really human decisions. They can be maybe influenced by the systems, by the people who stand behind the systems, maybe by the big tech. Can we, can we somehow fight this? Is it even possible to fight this? If the technology, technological development goes into the di in, in the direction of AI being virtually everywhere, how is how is that safe anymore? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Important point: the automation of juris jurisprudence uh, and court rulings. Uh, thank you, uh, Aneta Mulberg. I think you're going to speak for workers around the world, if not in Germany. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, actually, I wanted to start with your question, Marion. Um, um, I think we have to talk much more about uh, democracy and power, um, the power of, of um, firms to you make use of AI and, uh, and the very the need of a public interest, interest struct, infrastructure. Um, we lack infrastructures we use Zoom here. We, we don't even have basic communication infrastructures safeguarding the basic rights of self determination, informational self determination. And we are talking about you, you gave the example of kids, pupils, students, and so on. They are forced to go to school, which is good, but they are partly forced to use the infrastructure of private firms that do not follow the basic uh, uh, laws. And, um, and so I think we have to talk much more about offers of public infrastructures that really follow the basic laws. And um, 
so so I think I, I, I just want to make this point and think we, we should discuss this more uh, strongly. And then the second point indeed is on workers' rights. I think we also have to talk more about dependencies and power and that we have to also safeguard uh, the rights of those people who are in a dependency at work and, uh, and also their rights, not only of privacy, but also of security and the whole uh, decision-making um, that they are not uh, just objects, but also subjects in this process, just to make it short and highlight this, that there is a big issue here. Uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have uh, five minutes left, which is just time for our speakers uh, to give their takeaway um, outro uh, single statements. Rashi has had her hand up right from the beginning. So Rashi, I'm going to start with you from our six speakers. Uh, um, just one sentence takeaway, otherwise we'll go over time and we'll get kicked off. Thank you. I, I think we need to... Uh develop a more human-centered uh, and ethical approach to AI and also perhaps also look at the global south and enhance the diversity of different data sets because there are languages that are spoken more widely than English. So um, yeah, and also mobilize more. And if you really want to be more inclusive, then we have to kind of mobilize that participatory process and move towards that. Thank you so much. Um... Paul Amos, your takeaway. Paul? Yes, I'm there. Uh, oh, my, takeaway, my, my takeaway is that there is an appetite uh, for rules. Um, so we don't uh, live anymore in, uh, let's say, this world of techno-absolutism and neoliberalism in which the unbroken global internet was uh, the most important good uh, to be defended in discussions like this. I think we see a renaissance um, of democracy and the rule of law, uh, uh, also in the digital sphere and in the internet and also on AI. And I would say that is, that is a good thing. Um, and I would say, indeed, we have to maintain and strengthen the primacy of democracy over technology and, uh, let's say, capitalism uh, in terms of business models of big companies. Primacy of democracy is key also in this technical age. Thank you, thank you. And moving to Parminda. Yeah, very quickly. I think if AI doesn't bring us together, nothing would, it's so powerful. And if we don't want to come together now, get ready to organize ourselves around two poles of US and China who will suck up all AI power. And since the audience here is Europe dominated, let me warn them that they're deluding themselves by thinking that they are old rich along with US. They are being left out and there's no point being Commander. Oh, his, uh, his I'm connection. It, okay. Uh, I'm making it kind of legally binding through WTO uh, framework. So I think AI is the last chance of us getting together. So let's do it fast, thank you. Last chance. Thank you, Parminda. Moving to uh, Thomas Schneider. Well, I think I've, I've spoken enough, but um, of course, uh, we are aware of uh, where the powers lie, Parminda. Don't be afraid. The question is, um, in my case, we are a country of 8 million people, so we will probably not be the biggest power when it comes to uh, into the, uh, the developing uh, AI uh, tools, although we are quite good at research, but then it's normally others that then make the money of things that we research because we don't have the capital to, to do that. So, um, But of course, I'm always open to your good ideas on how to create more equal chances for the, the smaller and poorer countries to compete in this system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Renata? Let's hope for a multilateralism renaissance. Uh, bring it back because I, I see it as the way, only way where countries in the global south can exercise democratic power and where we can, like, you know, uh, these are global rules that are fair for everybody. And let's make this uh, digital transition and this process feminist and sustainable. Thank you. And Michelle. Sorry. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, 
I agree with this um, commitment to reduce the harms of AI um, environmentally and on humans um, and how we can challenge the dominant narratives of AI as a thing that will save us and call that into question while also building alternatives that have the public interest at heart. So let's divest from big tech and let's build the sustainable, equitable alternatives that we need. Thank you. And I'm going to end with a question from the floor from Agiro and her students in Greenwich. We have no time to answer it, but I'd like us to leave with the question in our minds. Um, can or is a human rights approach enough to keep the human in the loop in such a rapidly automated ecology environment we're living in? Are humans being uh, de or de uh, decommissioned? So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your input, your focus, your amazing ideas, uh, robot rights, yes. Um, we after all are, are all cyborgs. We're going to end the session now. Um, to the technical crew, thank you so much. To our live captioner, thank you so much. To our speakers, so much. And uh, let's all hope that we can one day have a conversation with a computer called Helena rather than Hal. And Helena will listen to us rather than uh, pretend they're listening to us, which of course is my reference to uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Thank you so much, everyone. Big clap. Have a good evening and uh, see you uh, around. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.